waiting for, uh, our fearless leader, Matthew Miller. Thank you. Can everybody hear me without a microphone? Yeah. Yep. Awesome. No? no? Well, awesome. I will try and speak somewhat loudly. All right, this is my um, State of Fedora talk. How many people here were at DevConf in February? Okay, so much of the room. So um, some of the numbers um, may be repeats for you. I've tried to update a lot of the data, but this is essentially the, the ongoing State of Fedora talk that I do, and some of it may seem very familiar to you. Um, although now we are in Krakow. I'm also curious, uh, for whom is this the first flock? Yeah. Wow, yeah. awesome. That is <laughs> welcome, welcome, everybody. Someone this is concerned with getting new contributors into Fedora, so I'm glad to see that you're here. Um, so I like to start out with some press quotes, and uh, although we had good press for Fedora 24, none of them had glowing quotes to pull here, so here are my glowing quotes from Fedora 22 and Fedora 23. Um, and both of these are of note because uh, especially the register here is a very snarky trade magazine that tends to have almost always find something negative to say. Um, but in their review here of us that basically is um, glowing, so I am going to keep highlighting this. Uh, I think it's, it's pretty exciting. Uh, and then um, the main part of my presentation here is basically a bunch of numbers. And I, uh, a lot of these are pulled together from uh, our mirroring data. We don't do any intrusive monitoring of Fedora users at all. There's no uh, tracking cookie or anything that uh, follows you around and makes sure that you're counted, which means that we're kind of uh, doing like you know, a wildlife sampling and trying to figure out what's going on from looking at binoculars from a distance. Uh, one of the ways we do that is by looking at connections to our mirror server. And so I have promised uh, Steve Smugin that when I show, talk about these numbers, I preface them with a scary dinosaur. This one, uh, it doesn't look so scary, but a whole herd of them will just get you. So uh, th the important things to know are that, um, again, because we're not tracking, there's a lot of differences in networks that will uh, really influence how these results look like. Uh, so uh, network address translation means that uh, a lot of different systems can be counted only as one system and uh, changing IP addresses. It happens that a lot of ISPs change your IP address multiple times a day. That might be overcounted, and there's a lot of other things that could cause um, confusion. But uh, I think the general trends can be uh, basically counted on. Um, and so this is a slightly confusing chart, but this is basically those connections for the last uh, five releases here, going from the green Fedora 20 uh, in the, on the, this left. Uh, over to uh, Fedora 24 rising there. And uh, the, I guess the important thing to see is we've got a general upward trend with each release being more popular than the last. And we've got a very nice quick start to Fedora 24 with it already being more popular than 22. And I think, you know, uh, by the end of the summer, it's going to be the release that most Fedora users are running. So I think uh, that that is very nice. Um, we're, uh, when we look at the absolute numbers, which I don't have a slide for, there's actually kind of a leveling off, which I'm a little concerned with, but I'm hoping it's kind of a summer downturn. We'll see um, what happens at this talk next year when I have kind of a better, better <coughs> handle on what those numbers look like. But right now, things are very positive looking. So uh, everybody who worked on this release, the last couple of releases, you should give yourself a hand. Good job. <laughs> So um, this is the other metric that people often ask about, and that's uh, ISO downloads. So this is basically just a raw count over time of every day how many times people are downloading uh, the release. And I think the interesting thing about this is after a, a big peak when, they, when we have a first release, it's basically just a constant amount over there. So the number of downloads happens to basically correspond to how long that release lasts. So uh, 21 and 22, there's a total of about 800,000 downloads. And it's like a million for Fedora 23 because it was a longer cycle there. And if you look back at the previous two releases, which were about a year cycle each, those were like 1.2 million each. So it's kind of a constant thing. Although there's a spike, um, we don't necessarily have a big uh, uptick um, just because we have a new release. So I think that's an interesting thing to think about as we're doing marketing and uh, look a little bit more marketing Fedora as a whole rather than marketing just what's in the latest release. Um, another thing you're 
probably noticing here is that there's a definite downward trend here, and that actually also comes off to the left. That's higher as well, uh, where it's cut off. Uh, I believe that this is because we've made upgrades so much easier, so there's no need to download an ISO in order to go to the next release. On the other hand, I would love to see this going up despite that. So um, <laughs> there it is. Um, and this is a breakdown of um, the different Fedora editions and what percentage of the downloads are represented there. So this is downloads again, not connections. Um, and I have also a slide with all of the different spins included here, so which gets a little bit crazy. Uh, so I'll look for first at this one with just, with just the main uh, editions that we promote. Uh, and obviously you can see uh, Workstation is about 70% you know, of the downloads there, but we've got a pretty solid uh, download set for server. Um, for blah, blah, blah reasons, this actually ends in January and does, has not been updated for the last half a year, but it looks to me like the trend basically continues like this. Uh, one of the interesting things is this gray bit there. We didn't have a network installer for Workstation earlier, uh, and when we introduced that, it instantly became very popular. Uh, and you can see it kind of takes a little bit of a chunk out of the server installs because people were using the server net ISO in order to get a workstation install and once it was available, they stopped. Can I uh, interject for a second? Yeah. That doesn't look like it actually took a bite out of the server net install. You actually have that as a separate band. This way to a server took a bite out of the server not net install. Right, uh, yeah, yeah. Pe people were using the server. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, it didn't take a bite out. People didn't stop using the server net install very much, it's true. Um, but, yeah, uh, that's a good point. Um, I, I would love to know why that happened. Yeah, it looks like the net, the, I, I attributed it to people switching from the server net install, but uh, the point is that um, actually that doesn't decrease, it's just that the net install increases. So uh, I don't know, I don't have a good answer to that. Um, the other thing that I think is very interesting here is you can see Atomic is this tiny green band around there, and those are very small numbers. Um, but again, these are downloads of basically the install media, or, the, or in the case of that, it's the, um, the launchable media. Uh, and because these are cloud instances, it's really hard to tell the difference between one person downloaded and ran at one time, or they downloaded it and didn't run it at all, or they downloaded it and ran it a million times. Uh, and it happens, I had a conversation with a large internet company that you have heard of at Red Hat Summit, and they came up and were asking me some questions and about Fedora Atomic, and then they said that they've been actually running it in production for about six months. And I said, oh, that's interesting. At what kind of scale? And they said, oh, at all of the scale. And this is a company where all of the scale is, um, it may be the most popular Fedora running at all right now. So, uh, <laughs> that, so the, li the little line doesn't necessarily tell, tell the whole story. Uh, yeah. I'm actually surprised that we have that many cloud downloads because it seems like most people getting the cloud edition would actually get it directly yeah. from Amazon or DigitalOcean. Right. So one of the reasons we have a lot of cloud downloads, first of all, there's people uh, running it in OpenStack. And the other thing is that this is our only Vagrant image we currently produce. The people who are looking for a Vagrant image are directed to the cloud image. So that is, uh, that is the bulk of those cloud download images. Um, and I, I would actually, I think we should make those for the other editions as well, but we haven't currently. So that's, that's what's going on there. Um, you probably can't hear me so well if I turn this way, so I'm gonna try and stop doing that and I'll try and look at my <laughs> slides down here. Um, but some of these little lines are very hard to see on a small screen. So this is all, all the different spins there. You can see, um, although the individual other spins are not never hugely popular, although with uh, KDE being the largest at about a 5% band across there, um, <laughs> The aggregate, you know, the net result of all these different things does add up to a lot of various interests. So I think that's kind of a, a cool thing that we have. Uh, I think the breakdown here was 4% uh, KDE and then um, LXDE and XFCE are about 2.5% each. Um, but I know that um, th those are a very passionate 2.5%, so that's a, a good thing. Um, Okay, uh, so I also have some external numbers which I think are very interesting as well. So um, one of the, uh, the main target for Fedora Workstation is software developers and it happens uh, that the site Stack Exchange, who is familiar with Stack Overflow? All right, awesome, everybody, right? Uh, who's not familiar with this? Uh, yes, awesome. So QA site targeted at developers. They do an annual survey and one of the questions they ask is what is your preferred desktop operating system? 
And so uh, this year their survey results came out and it's pretty cool, it's good for Linux at um, 21 something percent and that's actually a gain for, you know, up a percent from last year. Windows is slowly creeping down to no longer be the majority, just a plurality. Uh, OS X is also growing there. Uh, so this is cool for Linux. Um, if we break that down, this is from a year ago, uh, the breakdown by which Linux distributions are there. Fedora is in the top four, uh, that is to say we are the fourth of the top four, but we, we get a name showing at least. Um, now, and there's some reasons that this, um, it, it's not a huge surprise, Fedora has had a reputation of being uh, harder to use, fast moving, and you, you know, can't get your media there, but we would really like to see that growing. And so um, this year's survey, I would love to say, wow, look, we doubled it. Um, we are up a little bit, but it's kind of noise. So I feel like um, this is a part where we really have some work to do in the marketing and outreach to software developers if we're gonna keep pursuing the strategy of trying to you know, grow in software developer space. And it's not necessarily that we wanna compete with the other, other Linuxes there. This isn't percentage of Linux, this is a percentage of everything. If Ubuntu has 12% and we have 20%, I'll be perfectly happy. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> but I would really like to see us, um, uh, see that number going up in the future. Um, and it's actually, um, there's a lot of questions in this survey and they have a full data, anonymized data dump of it. So if there's interesting questions we can have about what other technologies people like, what areas we can um, grow in, I think analyzing that data might be a fun project for somebody. Um, I was starting to do it, but then I realized that would be like a PhD thesis for me and I have other, other things I should be doing instead. So, <laughs> but if anybody else wants to do a project like that, uh, come talk to me. All right. Um, so uh, that those were numbers basically about uh, the operating system itself, but Fedora is obviously you people more than it is just the, the, the downloads. Um, so uh, I tried to answer some questions about this, and if you saw the DevComp talk, you saw some of these things about this. Uh, these numbers are not updated from there, but um, uh, some of the other numbers coming up will be here. Uh, so uh, as people probably know, we have a message bus where basically a lot of the activity you do in Fedora uh, causes something to be generated that can be responded to by other applications or other people. And uh, basically most of our online applications are hooked up to this. And so when I wanted to count like what are the active contributors in Fedora, I said, okay, I will we'll take a look at that and see what we can see. And I particularly looked at certain areas which are easy to count, ones where an actual human being caused the event and um, rather than it wasn't a bot that just mentioned that person or some sort of event or related to a person that wasn't due to their action. And so the three areas that I kind of narrowed down to that being possible are uh, first editing the wiki page, which is straightforward. Um, and, but it's important, everybody here knows our wiki is not like the Arch wiki where it's dedicated just to documentation. This doesn't mean, this section here doesn't represent docs writers it represents people do, using it as a workspace in all sorts of different areas, QA and ambassadors and everything else where the wiki is kind of our, our workspace. Um, the other one is Bodhi, which is basically somebody gave feedback on, a, on an update. And here I'm only counting logged in users with your fast name, so there's anonymous updates too, but those aren't getting counted. Uh, and then finally in this littler circle here, that's packagers who uh, basically were, you know, did at least one commit to just get uh, made an update to a package there. Um, and so I think it's interesting that there's uh, a lot of non-overlap between those things. And I think this means probably that um, because these are three random things I could sample, I know there's a lot of areas like translations uh, which aren't counted here and a lot of ambassador activity. So when I say there's 2,000 plus contributors here, that's 2,000 plus in the easily measured area. So I think we probably have I probably twice that in terms of active contributors in a year to Fedora. Um, and I happen to do this on a year basis, so I'll probably update these numbers for the next DevConf and we'll see how we've got changes here. Um, I would like to measure more things. I know um, Zanata, the translation thing, recently got hooked up, but it does not generate messages <laughs> with usernames that I can easily measure here. So um, that might be some Fed message hacking to get more things hooked up for me to count. If you have an area you think I should be counting, um, that's the place to start. Um, and uh, I also took basically uh, the top 10% here as a different presentation. Um, 
and it kind of has the same overall overall picture ratio of people there. And I'll talk a little more about that top 10% of contributors in a little bit. But one thing I wanted to mention here, if you have not seen this slide before, this is one of uh, my favorite ones as I keep uh, getting asked by people basically inside and outside Red Hat, you know, how much of the work on Fedora is being done just by Red Hat? Is this a really a Red Hat thing worth one or two external contributors? Or is this, um, yeah, so I analyzed that top 10%, which uh, basically is the people who do about two thirds of the work. And I did not do this with a script because I could knock some of them off easily, but some of them I basically went through name by name and identified if that person is a Red Hatter or not. Because it turns out that um, there's this blue area here, which I, I have to explain myself, it's not actually sneaky. Uh, if you look there, you'll find that I am actually MacDM at MacDM.org, not uh, at FedoraProject.org. Uh, and that's because I had all these filters set up for my email before I started working for Red Hat and they filtered out my Fedora email very nicely and I didn't want to redo that. Um, so there's a lot of people who are Red Hatters now but were visible in the community before who came to Red Hat and that's generally what this 9% here represents. Not really people trying to, you know, not proud of being a Red Hatter. Uh, so, but uh, the basic number here is really we've got uh, two external contributors in the core of you know, people doing most of the work in Fedora for every one Red Hatter, which I think is a pretty awesome issue. Yeah. Um, okay, um, now I have um, geeky breakdowns of where this came from. Uh, so this this is um, basically a chart of the messages of, uh, so when is this? Uh, this is the Bodhi feedback here. Uh, over time for the past uh, three years here, two and a half years, uh, and basically, this is the um, yeah the, num the number of people per week, uh, and this is you know the one percent uh, and next ten percent and so on there. Um, basically, and I, and I put these on the same scale here, so you can kind of see. So um, there are a lot more people who actually make changes per week. Uh, for even, even though the number the number of actual um, people involved overall in Bodhi was higher. Um, there's just a lot of changes to packages all the time, as we all probably know. And there's the wiki edits as well. Um, and here's the part where I got to where I got to the two thirds number, and this basically holds true for all across all of the different things here, um, where basically uh, of the people who are in like a rolling window of the people who did who are responsible for uh, one for the uh, top top percentage of of the messages. Um, you can basically again see that the top 1% here does somewhere around 20% of the work. So there are a lot of people who are very, very busy and I'm sure you will be able to guess a lot of those names if you think of somebody you see all the time doing everything. It's, it's one of those people. But this um, next 10% ends up doing basically about two thirds of the work, which I actually think is a pretty good ratio. When I started to look at this, I was afraid we'd see something more like 90-10 or even 80-20, um, so I think that's, that's pretty good. Um, it'd be kind of nice to see if we could expand the long tail and have um, more of the work done by thousands of other people, but um, it's still, in, you know, the 300 people doing that uh, there is still a pretty big number, so that's a good core group. Um, so, uh, there's some interesting spikes here. Um, these uh, big spikes here are uh, package, are uh, mass, uh, the mass rebuilds where uh, basically, somebody in release engineering rebuilt everything, so they get credit for that. Um, that is going to, right. That is being done by a Relenge um, user now. Um, this data set counts the Relenge user as a human, even though I didn't count it in that 300. But, um, but I actually um, put it in as a in my blacklist of bots for the next time I run this, and I tried to rerun it, and then I broke Data Grepper. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, that's not updated to show that, but. Um, that's uh, what's going on there. And there's one other one that has a funny spike. Um, here, these, these dropouts here, what you're seeing here is Christmas vacation, Christmas vacation, Christmas vacation <laughs> there every year, um, where people um, tend to uh, do a lot less work across all of the board there. Uh, and you can see in, in the packages here, particularly the casual contributors drop out during Christmas, which uh, make makes sense. If you're making you know an update to one pa to a package once a year, the odds of you doing it in Christmas, you know, on your vacation, yeah, smaller. There's no, there's no change in the top right, exactly. But people, I was, was going to note the people here down here. Um, Peter is working 24/7, um, <laughs> and Dennis and a lot of other people. 
uh, update things no matter what. And uh, uh, all right, so um, this one is basically uh, I've broken down in percentage by and the, the colors are different here. This is basically uh, the green are actions by people who uh, are new in this week. The yellow is people who are new in this month, but not the week. And the green, or the red, is people who are uh, new this year, at least. And then uh, the blue is people who've been active for more than a year. Uh, so we've got a, a constant uh, you know, influx of new people here all the time. This is in the, the Bodhi feedback here. Uh, but a pretty large majority of this is done by people who have been around for at least a year. Um, and in the packet, see this is the release engineering user, by the way, when it was created, that caused that spike. Uh, in general though, um, the packaging in particular, like 90% 90, 90 of the packaging is done by people who have been around for more of the year, more than a year, um, which that's kind of a hard technical skill, so it's not completely surprising. Um, and by, I should mention that um, been around for means mention in this data set, so people could have been Fedora contributors for five years, but um, it's, the, it's the activity by someone who, who started that year that is counted here. Um, so it would be kind of nice to get some of them, get more new users into the packaging group in particular. Uh, and Wiki, uh, it, uh, as you might expect, expect to see, um, has a lower barrier to entry and more newer users there. Um, and we should have a special um, shout out to Patrick. Where's Patrick here? Uh, um, I can't pronounce his last name because I think that nobody, I don't think he can pronounce his own last name. Uh, yeah, yeah, there, good. It's a right, it's the closest I can get and I know it's horribly wrong. Um, so we've been under attack by spammers in the wiki and so you, um, may know that if you are not in uh, at least one additional Fedora group of some sort, you cannot edit the wiki right now, which is kind of unfortunate. Uh, although, because it is sort of a group workspace, uh, it doesn't really impede um, contri new contributors to Fedora as much as it might if it were really meant to be an easy to get to um, resource. Um, but I think it's kind of a problem and I don't know a good way around it, but we've done a good job of um, at least keeping that down to zero for the past couple weeks, um, or at least zero that uh, were visible to me. Um, okay, and I'm going to try and not use all my time on numbers here, but I also wanted to mention the Fedora magazine. Um, uh, this is uh, also something that's been very successful. and uh, this. I think that these are just basically page view for months, and the important thing is we've got a nice upward trend here. Uh, the red dots are when there was a Fedora release that month, so you can see those are obviously going to be peaks, um, but there's a general trend in growth as well. And there's been, if you've been following the content, um, a lot of growth in really good, solid articles that are really useful to people there. So I'm, I'm really uh, excited for and proud of and thankful to everybody who's been working on Fedora Magazine. Uh, so. Uh, that's the end of my numbers section. Um, I'll have some room for questions at the end, I think, but we'll, we'll go ahead and see how this goes. Um, last time at, Dev, at DevConf, I had about three minutes to rush through the big goals section, so I'll try and uh, give myself a little more time here. Uh, the important thing is that I do not set the goals for Fedora. I have a name leader in my title, but really what I try to do and what we as uh, Fedora leadership and the Fedora Council try to do is discern the collective goals of basically everyone here in this room and everyone who couldn't be here today in the Fedora contributor community. Um, so um, yeah, it's, it's you guys who set the goals. And actually, as I was going through the things, I was like, okay, yeah, that's important, I should mention that. I realized that most of these correspond to talks that are happening at this conference, um, which uh, means I think things are going, going exactly as they should be. That's what this conference is for, and it means that these aren't just ideas that I pulled out of my head, but they're ideas that we're all working together on. Um, the first one is basically that the release train is gonna keep going. We're gonna have Fedora 25 released in, you know, October-ish, um, November, uh, that kind of thing. And we really uh, want to stick to this idea of having an October release and a May release every, every year so that you can know that that's gonna be the cadence of what Fedora does. And if we happen to slip in one release, we'll make the next release short to make up for it. This is kind of a new policy in the, next, in the last um, 
the last couple of releases, even though it's sort of nominally been the policy, but really trying to stick to it is a new experiment we're doing. Um, I think it's going to be okay. Um, this particular release is kind of rush because that's the consequences of doing that. Um, so we'll see how that comes out. Um, but uh, I, and I think uh, probably most people here know what the, the basic features are going in this release. Um, I, if this were a talk to a general audience, I would probably dwell on those a bit more. Um, there are some talks about the release process. Um, Dennis Gilmore has a talk about getting things into Fedora, and Ralph Bean has a talk about a thing called Factory 2.0, which is basically upgrading this to a diesel engine of some sort, or maybe like an electric <laughs> locomotive. Um, it's going to be awesome. Um, what's that? Maglev, Maglev, awesome. That's why wow, we're going way next generation. I thought it was 2.0. We're going right to 10.0 or something. Yeah. Um, so one of the really big things here, I think, is uh, this idea called modularity. And this is something that started at Flock four years ago, or maybe a little before that, but I had a talk at Flock there about this idea called Fedora Rings. And uh, I had, I think, this Lego slide was in that talk, and it's been carried forward ever since because everybody loves Lego. Um, and uh, at DevConf, I basically said, this should be the year where we can do it. Stop talking about this so much and actually get to show and tell. And I'm really excited. Um, Langdon White is going to be actually doing a show and tell presentation. So if you're interested in this, uh, how we're going to put the distribution together in the future, um, I think uh, you should go to that talk. It's going to be very exciting, and it's actually uh, not just abstract concepts, but actual working demo. Uh, it's pretty cool, and a lot of the things, the idea that a module is something that's not an RPM, it's bigger than an RPM, but you can actually put it together in a workflow that looks very much like what you do to put together a package. So there's a diskette-like thing, uh, and that kind of same mechanisms that we use for packaging will be used for making a module, and I think uh, the goal is to open it up so it's not just an elite few who make Fedora modules, but we have a whole contributor community to making modules, just like we have for packages now. Um, uh, another big thing that I am interested in uh, is a university outreach goal. And this is, again, going back to new users and maybe attracting the next generation of developers. Uh, this is something that has been, we've been talking about for a while, but has not quite picked up steam. So I hope that this is the conference where we uh, get that steam going. I guess we're back to the train metaphors of picking up steam. Uh, Justin Flory and uh, Yona, is that how you pronounce your name? Are you here? Uh, I don't know. Uh, have a talk about that, um, and I forget what day that's on, but it's Justin, Justin Flory? Today. today. Today, today, awesome, there you are. Yes, talk today about that. Um, so I'm excited to see how, how that goes as well, because I think we really need to make sure we keep getting young people into Fedora, or else it's going to end up being an old people's distribution, which is not what we want to be. Uh, another one of our outreach efforts is this Fedora Loves Python. Uh, Miro Hrancek has a talk about this. Uh, this is kind of a marketing idea. Again, we said we were going to try and address the needs of developers. And in talking about that in Fedora marketing earlier this year, we came to the conclusion that developers is a very broad target. And that maybe by biting off one smaller bit first and saying, OK, we've got good relationships in the Python community. Uh, we've got good Python tooling in Fedora. Uh, let's try and market specifically to Python developers. So we went to PyCon and handed out awesome Fedora uh, Python t-shirts and talked to a lot of people there. So there's an ongoing effort to specifically attract some of those Python developers, kind of to show if we try to address these developers, here's an area where we can have growth, and then we can broaden that out to bringing in you know, the Java developers and the .NET developers, because I talked to Microsoft at Red Hat Summit, and they were very interested about how they could use the Fedora packaging guidelines to correctly get .NET packaged up for Fedora. I said, wow, and they were very serious about it. So um, let's, let's see how that goes. But if we're now Python, um, so uh, another big thing I've been talking about for yes, Adam. Yeah, .NET .NET is an open source thing. We're not going to include a, some closed source .NET in Fedora. Don't worry. Um, .NET uh, Microsoft seems to have uh, a change of heart, and at least from the engineering level, they seem really sincere about it. So that's awesome, Langdon. Also called a change of CEO. A change of CEO also helps. Yeah, exactly. Uh, 
Uh, hubs is something I've been talking about for a long time. Uh, I didn't have the IRC meeting slide on here, but uh, as everybody here knows, the core of Fedora activity is on IRC and mailing lists, which are awesome and useful tools, but also completely invisible to people outside of a very nerdy subset of the world. They're a hard barrier to get into. The IRC culture, let alone setting up an IRC client, registering a NIC and figuring out what a NIC serve is and a channel and all these things. Um, those are difficult. Mailing lists are something that um, basically, um, you know, people don't want to subscribe to anymore. And even if it, um, even as something other than a barrier to getting involved in Fedora, it's something where you look at the Fedora website and you can't tell that anything is going on when we really have thousands, literally, of IRC med meetings every year and, you know, multiple meetings a day and so much lines of chat and so much activity happening, uh, people can't see it and that makes it um, easy to dismiss Fedora as a vital ongoing project. So this hubs idea is basically uh, to bring all that onto the web, which is what most people think of when they think of the internet today. So we want to make sure we are visible on, you know, the internet. Uh, so um, there is a talk on HyperKitty, and there's a talk about uh, bringing IRC to the hubs. And then uh, more important than that, there is actually a hack fest to actually work on this on Friday. So if that's interesting to you, go to that. Uh, next, uh, Fedora Atomic. Uh, we've been doing this kind of cool thing where instead of waiting every six months to have a release, we've had a every two weeks, give or take, a release of the latest version of the Atom Fedora Atomic Coast with updates. Um, as I said before, um, large company is relying on us for this, so that's cool. Um, but more than that, uh, I really think that this idea of containerized bits of the operating system are probably the future of the OS, from the server to the desktop. And we see um, operating systems like CoreOS and Rancher OS in the bleeding edge there. And um, I often talk about Fedora not wanting to be the bleeding edge, but we definitely want to be the leading edge. We want to make sure that when those, well, we can, we, it's okay to let other people experiment with the crazy ideas, but when they start looking like, hey, that crazy idea might be onto something, we should be in the forefront of the experimentation as well. And so Atomic is basically our, our way of getting involved in that. And I think that as time goes on, and especially in you know, connection with the modularity work, um, this is really going to be core to how we put together Fedora. Um, and so I think this is a really big deal. And one of the parts of this uh, in particular is looking at OpenShift, which is a kind of a, not just a single host cluster system, but a, a, a container system, but a clustered one. Um, and so uh, Josh Burkus here has a hack fest about that. Is that also on Friday? Mm -hmm. Thursday, I think. Thursday, th yeah. uh, Hackfest about that, which is important. Um, and we've got a lot of other talks about Atomic in general and containers. Um, one of them is the Docker layered image build service that Adam Miller put together and with a lot of other people's help as well. Um, and that service basically, like I said with the modules, um, you'll be able to uh, sign up to be the maintainer of a Docker file, a Docker container, just like you can sign up to be the maintainer of a package and you can uh, maintain the container uh, right now composed out of RPMs from the RPM set. Uh, and it uses the same sort of, the exact same tools, builds and Koji, the same way that RPMs built. So I think that's really exciting. Uh, 10 minute warning, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, the next thing talking about um, those similar kind of technologies, Flatpak is a method for distributing uh, and running uh, desktop applications with the eventual goal of running them in a secure sandbox way so you can uh, download random applications from somewhere and trust that they won't take over your system. Uh, it's pretty cool technology coming from the freedesktop.org people um, and there's a big push on that in Fedora Workstation. Um, and I don't know if we have any specific talks on that, but there is a talk about the future of Fedora Workstation, which I'm sure will mention Flatpak as well. Uh, and we also have an ongoing conversation in the Fedora Council uh, about uh, allowing people outside of Fedora to make flat packs available to Fedora users in our Fedora in the software center and Fedora workstation and how we will handle that kind of thing um, because availability of applications is one of the things that uh, comes back to people uh, comes back to us a lot when we were like why did you choose something other than Fedora um, so uh, that's one of the interesting technologies um, and 
Uh, that is the end of my highlights there, although I'm sure that there are lots of other exciting highlights uh, in, in this conference. I didn't mention everything. Those are just some of the ones that really stuck out to me. Um, I want to thank the people who helped me put together the statistics at the beginning, uh, Steve Smugin and Ralph Bean. Uh, and also, um, just thanks to everybody for being so awesome. Um, Fedora would not be what it is without you, so um, thank you very much. And I guess we have like eight, oh, Joe, go ahead. Yes, we have about eight minutes for questions or between talks. I do, I forgot one very, very important thing earlier. We need help recording and transcribing talks. So, um, folks who have not yet volunteered, uh, I created a bit.ly link to make it easier to get here. We have a wiki page for people to sign up to start the recordings, time the talks as uh, somebody has been doing here, and also uh, we need help transcribing so if you're a fast typer into IRC rooms for each talk. Uh, if you go to bit.ly slash flock 16 help, all lowercase, that will take you to the wiki page where you may sign up. Thanks. Awesome. Okay. Uh, any questions? Anybody? Yes. So I found your statistic about the new contributors who are packaging pretty interesting, but I think it would be even more interesting if copper were in there because there's a lot lower barrier to entry for copper, and it would be curious to see that same, same statistic for both Bodhi and copper. Yes. So the question there was uh, not a question at all, but a comment to me, which was that copper, including copper, would be good. And I think copper actually generates those messages with the user tied to them. Um, so yeah. I'm not sure why I didn't include it. So I will definitely do that once I've unbroken data grepper. Um, I see. Thank you. Yes, Josh. Okay. Uh, not Josh. Uh, David. Do you have any stats on um, packages that make it all the way through Bodhi without getting any karma? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Basically, ever get more than one car bomb. But that doesn't mean that my packages are usually esoteric and therefore. Yeah, I do not have those stats offhand. The question was do we have stats on packages that, that do not ever get that feedback in Bodhi um, and make it through without anybody ever looking at them? Um, does somebody from QA have the answer to that offhand? I'm out of that. I know that. Yeah. I was just curious because that, I don't know, that may not be a slide. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I'm happy to show the slides that don't look so good. Yeah, um, they're, th those are what we call things to work on slides. So that's, um, yeah, I don't know, but that's a good, uh, interesting question. Yeah. Do we have any statistics? Uh, for the last year and change, we've been pushing uh, on the university and the diversity initiatives. Have we had any, do we have any kind of statistics on whether or not that has had any effect? Yeah. So the question is, do we have any statistics on the diversity and university initiatives? Uh, the answer is no, I think. Um, I, no, no, no data or no, no effect? No data. Um, I, uh, I hope that we've been having some effect. I, the university thing has been kind of slow, but I think we've been having, there was a Fedora Women's Day, which was, I think, very successful. Uh, so hopefully that is having an effect. Um, and I know that Tadika, um, who is our diversity advisor, is working on a survey um, and that once we start having that survey, that will give us some sort of measurable things to do, but we don't actually have that yet. Five minutes. Yeah. Uh, so regarding the number of contributors from the local edition, for 24, we ran the print for 50 contributors. Okay. Uh, I think we are already in the loss for the data and print message indications. Maybe we get more. Okay. So the comment was there were about 50 people who worked on translations over the last, um, uh, for Fedora 24. Is that just in the sprint or was that over the whole release? Oh, okay, so about 50 people working in the translations. Do you know um, what percent, it, what the, it, does it break down into like, again, 10% of people doing most of the work who probably follows the same, same pattern as well? Um, but yeah, I'd definitely be interested in adding that. Um, yeah. Do you have any statistics uh, how many people upgrade the network as opposed to uh, doing new installs and, uh, and, and when they upgrade the uh, whole method they use? Yeah. Do we have statistics about what upgrade method they use? No, I do not. Um, but I can tell that you know, it's, again, because the ISO downloads are going down and the number of people running the new releases are going up, 
Um, some good chunk of people are choosing to upgrade. Um, I think there's some ways we can pull that out of the mirror data, but it's a little bit hard because um, you can't. You definitely can't tell um, easily the difference between somebody doing a DNF upgrade that pulled down a lot of packages and an actual update um, without doing deeper analysis that would involve keeping more logs than we're keeping. I, I have some ideas. About okay. That. Yeah, let's talk about that later. Um, there are definitely some things we can do, and I think that when people do an upgrade using the graphical upgrade, I think that we've got a way to measure that, but that just started, so I haven't been able to do that. Justin. Is there a way that we have, or are there any statistics available for measuring activity per continent or like per region of the world? Yeah. yeah. So the question is activity per region of the world. Um, do you mean contributor activity or user activity? Contributor activity. Uh, we have information on where contributors are from, so that could be analyzed, but I have not really done that. But yeah, we actually do, I mean, people, people put in where they're from when they sign up for an account, so we could go and look at that, and that would be a good thing to do. Uh, we've tried to do some analysis of where people are coming from in the mirror manager stats, and that's actually a thing that is, uh, one of those things that uh, ends up being a dinosaur. Um, the stats are heavily skewed to users in connect, uh, areas where there are reliable, always on internet connections. So people in Latin America, people in uh, remote parts of Asia, are, and definitely people in Africa, are being undercounted there. People who have high speed internet in Europe and North America are overcounted. Uh, so uh, if you look at the breakdown there, it basically tells you that's the case. So it doesn't really, um, but, but um, for contributors, we have you know, more granular data that we could look at. I think I have time for one more question. You already asked a question. Is there <laughs> anything else? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the question is, um, have we thought about privacy uh, in the um, broadcast with all the same stuff going on on bed message? Um, a lot of the stuff, uh, yeah, so uh, a lot of the reasons we don't have more invasive data is um, less uh, you being careful about privacy. Um, but the fed message stuff where your name is attached to a thing you did, um, we have, I, I know you raised that issue recently. Um, we have really not um, looked into that very much before. Um, I uh, really find the data valuable, but I also understand you know, the importance of um, not tracking individuals, like particular location and time of action. So it's possible that we could look at you know, anonymizing uh, older data or something that would make that, uh, you know, like even just uh, knocking things down to um, you know, actions per day instead of actually per minute kind of thing would probably make a lot of uh, additional privacy. All right, um, thank you everybody for coming and uh, have a wonderful flock. <laughs>